Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. That said, if you're in the North Georgia area and you don't have a church you call home, we'd love to have you come and visit Brainerd, North Georgia. I'm praying that this message serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, encourages you, and even challenges you, all the while bringing you closer to Jesus. So again, super excited that you're checking out this video. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for church, and I think that the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. All right, you guys ready for God's Word? All right. Go to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and in particular, we're going to be in the first four verses of Ephesians chapter 6. I don't know about you guys, but I hope that you guys enjoyed uh, Dr. Danny Aiken. If you were part of uh, the marriage conference uh, this weekend, uh, my wife and I went and we saw a lot of people from uh, Brainerd, North Georgia that were there um, at the the marriage conference. If you weren't there uh, at the end of the message, uh, I'm going to call for an invitation for you guys to come down here and ask for forgetting. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. If you guys didn't get a chance to go, and I know all of us have different schedules, different things that are going on. Uh, Of course, it was Valentine's weekend. And and if you guys didn't know, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. (coughs) <clears throat> Just in case if you guys forgot, all right, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. But if you got all the things going on, do know that all of the sessions were recorded and uh, you guys will have an opportunity to be able to see those messages uh, that are going to be forthcoming as we put them together and you guys can benefit from them. So part of the marriage conference is, of course, it dealt with the, the subject matter of husbands and wives and marriage and all the rest. And one of the parts that we wanted to also include was the section that Dr. Aiken was going to be preaching about when it came to parenting. And so we wanted to round out the conference by also including that portion of the text um, that he was going to be preaching at at every one of our campuses. And so whether at downtown or whether at Chattanooga or here, uh, we're covering Ephesians chapter 6 that deals largely with uh, parenting and children and all of that. So... That way you guys can have a good, rounded uh, idea of the home and God's design and God's intention for it, all right? So that's what we'll do today, and then we'll pick right back up in Mark next week, and then we'll continue to plug away um, in that gospel, all right? But that being said, as I already mentioned, we're going to be talking about children and parenting. And let me uh, preface this as well with saying that uh, you might you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, if there was a message for me to check out, this is one of those messages. I don't have kids. I'm, I'm not even married. Um, so I'm, I'm good, Paul. Thanks thanks for giving me an opportunity to be able to, to just relax in church. I'll sip some more coffee and then we'll go from there. Uh, there are some things in here in this text that are incredibly, incredibly appropriate for all of us in this room. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, right, discipleship is part and parcel of every believer not just a few believers, not just parents. And so believe it or not, there are some things in here that uh, could spur you along to be able to say, you know what, the discipleship matters irrespective of what stage I am in life. For some of you, you're like, Paul, uh, I'm an empty nester and thank God. Um, I, I'm, I'm, this, I'm good, I'm cruising right now. And on top of that, like Dr. Aiken said over, over the weekend, right? Not only am I an empty nester, but before when I had kids, I was broke and didn't have anything. Now I'm an empty nester and I don't have kids and I have money. So I'm cruising right now. Like I'm good. <laughs> I'm really gravy right now, right? So listen to me, even for you guys that perhaps your empty nesters are praying for the day of empty nesting, uh, there's still portions of this that can be incredibly appropriate for you as you take the opportunity to be able to invest into the lives of other parents that desperately would love your wisdom on how you parented your children. And so just know that all of this um, is part and parcel for everyone, okay? So with that said, we're going to jump in, okay? Um, I'll never forget, I'll I'll remember distinctly, man, the day that uh, I found out uh, that we were having our first child. It was a really special day. Uh, if you know anything about my wife, she is the queen of surprises. She does a really good job of that, and she just loves being thoughtful, and she loves being able um, to be able to just surprise me in certain ways. And she's had a knack of doing this on birthdays. But I'll tell you, um, 
almost six years ago. This was quite possibly one of the best birthdays um, that I ever had, and it had everything to do with finding out uh, that we were having our first child. Now, I don't know, I don't know how Kay did this. It was incredible. But she found out two days before my birthday that she was pregnant. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person that once I find something out that's exciting and that's good, I can't hold it in for more than five minutes. I have to tell somebody, right? So how she did that for two, for 48 hours, I have no idea, okay? Especially when you know that you're expecting your first child. I mean, that's incredibly celebratory, right? And so she knew that it was my birthday two days before. You guys are probably picking up what I'm dropping already, but she decided to say, I'm going to surprise him on his birthday by letting him know that we're having our first child. Now, the cool thing is how she did it. For a while, six years, six years ago, this is the other thing that you guys learned from me. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm often pinned as an Apple advocate or like a, I have a side hustle for Apple because I can tell you everything about the iPhone, the iMac, everything. Like, I love all that stuff. So I was, I was really excited. I wanted to get an Apple Watch uh, at the time. And so my wife knew that that was the case. And so she ended up finding an empty box of an Apple Watch case. Now, if you, if you guys have ever seen one of those, right, they're, they're long, rectangular, you know, all the rest of that slim. And so she decided to say, oh, I'm going to get you an Apple Watch for your birthday, right? And so she uh, put a camera up. She hid it so that I didn't know where it was. And she brought me over, and she goes, hey, I want to give you your birthday party. And, you know, it's wrapped, so I'm like, I know what this is already, though. Like, I can tell. I'm like, yes, and I'm getting excited. And so I open it up and everything, and as I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, taking out the, the inner casing where the Apple Watch would be, I start sliding that out, and sure enough, there was the pregnancy test. And I was like, I knew it. 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 I, had, I knew you were pregnant because something was up. I can sense it in the air. And what's crazy is there is a long story that goes through all of that um, that I wish I had the time to tell. And it it actually goes back to how the Lord kept me here at Brainerd. It's a wild story, but that's another sermon for another day. But needless to say, man, it was an awesome day. I was elated. We were excited. It was so cool. We had planned to go down to see my parents at the same time. So it was super providential how God worked all of that out. In fact, what's crazy is when we went down to tell my parents, they didn't know And they ended up buying, in those days, you know where they would put like different names on the Coke bottles, on the two liters? You guys remember that? This means yes, that means no. Okay, just making sure you guys are live out there. Um, And they happened to buy Coke bottles that said abuelos. Now, that's the Spanish word for grandparents. And they had no idea that we were coming down there to tell them, hey, guess what? My wife's (laughs) pregnant. It's wild. It's the wildest thing. And so it was just kind of cool how it all shaked out. Now, on the one hand, maybe you remember that, man. You were elated. You were excited. All of that. And then and then reality hit. It hit for me. I'm about to be a parent, right? And I have to, I have to raise this adorable child that I'm about to have. And so it hit me like a ton of bricks. How on God's green earth am I going to be able to do this, right? Like everything started flooding into my head. How am I going to parent this child? What am I? So because now the weight of responsibility, the weight of me knowing that this is something that I'm going to be doing in my life, it just, it, it hit home. So I don't know if you're like me, we probably share this burden and we want to know <laughs> What in the world does God's word say about how we ought to parent within the home? What what does it say about the family, about children, about all of that? Now, let me caveat something, okay? The Bible, when it comes to how it speaks about the family and its design and how it exemplifies the gospel, it's, it's all there. But just so you guys know, the Bible was not primarily written to be a manual for parenting. You guys know that, right? How do I know that? Because nowhere do you find in the Bible tips of how you train your child how to drive, how to eat at the table, how to take a bath, right? How to go to bed. And and I find that the most strange thing, right? Of all the things that I really wish that God would put in the Bible of how to handle are the three essential things in life that every child fights, eating, bathing, and sleeping. Why is that the case? Just eat your food. It's chicken nuggets. I don't like it. It's yucky. It's pizza. Just eat the pizza. It's going to be good. I don't want the crust. Okay, I'll cut it for you. Just please. Three hours later, the pizza's eaten, right? 
Same thing with showering and all the, all the rest. Of it. It's just like, God, of all things, you know, that would have been really good <laughs> for all of us. But it's not there, right? The Bible does not, is not primarily written for us to have these manuals, these instructions for our kids that way. It's not. But it does speak about the design of the home and how God in his wisdom constructed the home for it to not only shine the gospel to the world, but God gave us a design just like he designed it in marriage of how there are roles to play and how God desires for the home to flourish in marriage based on what he says in his word. And the same thing is true within uh, the area of children and parenting. And what's interesting is, Though what the Bible says here in this one section of Ephesians may be short, it is profound. Profound in what it has to say. There's so much wisdom and so much instruction that you can find in just four verses when it comes to how we ought to parent that that Paul summarized it so well that it, it just causes us to say this is worthy of our time and our attention to know what Paul is saying here. And in these four verses, I think we can find what Paul is attempting to make a point of. And here's what I think Paul's trying to do. Knowing that God designed the home and designed parenting and designed the family, here's what I believe Paul desires for all of us to understand. I believe that God provides instructions for the home in order to reflect the gospel to the world. Do you know that your marriage is intended to reflect the gospel to the world? And what's more is I believe here what we find Paul doing is I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you instructions from the Lord as to how you can parent in a way that not only demonstrates the gospel, but it shows his good wisdom of how to be able to navigate this life with your children and how your children ought to respond to you as parents. Listen to me, irrespective of whether you're a single parent or you're a married couple navigating this, there's a lot of wisdom that is found here, all right? So with that in mind, if you're able to this morning, would you stand in honor of reading of uh, God's word and let's read verses one uh, through four this morning as we dive into this particular text. Verse one says this, children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we are profoundly thankful for the opportunity that you've given to us to not only see the wisdom of your word, but God, you've given us an opportunity to be able to learn from you, to see even the beauty in the relationship that you had with your son, Jesus. So Father, I pray that not only do we glean well from that relationship, but help us to see your wisdom and your instruction for us all. Help us to be able to lovingly admonish, bring up, help Our children, teach them much about you and about this life. God, I pray um, that you would help us to be the kind of parents that exemplify what it means um, to be able to show our children not only your son, um, but the wisdom of your word. God, we love you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. So there's three instructions that I want us to see from this text that I hope will help us see how Paul is desiring of us more than anything else for, for the gospel to be seen within our homes. Here are the three instructions. One is instructions for us personally. And we're going to consider the context uh, that we find from chapter 4 all the way up to chapter 6. In other words, I don't think it's coincidental that Paul begins to speak to us personally before he gets to parents. I think all of that is on purpose. Secondly, you're going to see the instruction for our children And then lastly, you're going to see the instruction for us as parents, all right? Let's begin with this first one, and y'all get caffeinated, okay? Because we've got a good bit to cover this morning, but I hope it will be a help for all of us. 
Paul here begins, I think, right before he gets to chapter 6 with giving all of us personally a great deal of instruction that I think is not coincidental to what he instructs us as parents to do. He begins with us because it's that important. In other words, Paul here brings to remembrance the church here at Ephesus the impact that the gospel has made within their lives. Okay, They heard the gospel. They were radically changed by the gospel. And here are people who previously did not know Jesus. Now they know Jesus, and now they're beginning to be changed by Jesus. And so he brings to mind to them a pattern of life that should be part and parcel of their every day. In other words, he says even in verse 17 of chapter 4, he says, Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and they gave themselves over to promiscuity and for practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more and more. And then in verse 20, he says, but that's not how you came to know Christ. Something different happened to them. They were walking a certain way of life, but now he says, that's not who you are. Therefore, walk differently because of who you are in Christ. In fact, he even uses this illustration in chapter 4 of somebody taking off an old useless garment for the sake of putting on a new one in order for them to use this new garment. Why? Because the other one is discarded because it's of no use. It's no good anymore. In fact, listen to what he says. (laughs) He says in verse 21, Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness, in purity of truth. In other words, he's saying to them, guys, you need to be living this new life. The gospel made this change, therefore live this way. In fact, he begins even chapter 5 by saying, I want you to imitate God. I want you to be like God. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, he says, I want you to pay careful attention then how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, right? And so what's Paul doing? He's building up this case right before he even gets to instructions for husbands and wives that you know who the first benefactors of your Christ-likeness, of this consistent way of living this new pattern of life should be. It should be your your spouse. They should see a change within your life to such a degree that they're like, man, this individual walks, talks, and acts like Jesus. And so the family is going to be recipients of the change of the gospel within a person's life. And so again, I don't find it coincidental that Paul here is beginning to to help them understand their identity and how that should make an impact within their home. And again, I don't find that coincidental that not only does it impact the the, the marriage life, it should even impact children. Why do I say all of that? Because I, I really do believe that Paul's intent is for parents to set a godly example before their children. It begins with us. And Paul wastes no time saying, I want you to imitate God. I want you... I want your children to see the gospel at work in your heart and in your lives. That's what I want more than anything else. And and that's very important for all of us, even though it's it's elementary in its concept, it's profound in what it does. I learned very quickly that my kiddos, they watch, they listen, and they see everything that I'm doing. And you guys know this to be the case, right? It's funny. One day, my, my daughter, out of nowhere, started saying, bro, everywhere. And, and that's me. Like, I say bro all the time, right? And so out of nowhere, she just, she, I came home and she's like, hey, bro. I'm like, what are you doing? Hey, daddy, dad, daddy, dad. That's okay, sir. <laughs> bro? <laughs> like, but why, she's watching everything that I'm doing. She's listening to everything that I'm doing all the time, right? Listen, did you know that, that our children watch how we not only do certain things in life, but they, 
You guys, they watch how we read our Bible. They watch how we pray and listen to how we pray, how we live at home, how we act at the store, how we treat our spouses, friends, coworkers, how we treat strangers, how we worship, how we make decisions. Do you, do you see why Paul has built this up from chapter 4? It's because we are the, the first line of the models of how they see Jesus at home. And so one of the, one of the things that Paul's trying to build up is that, guys, they, we, they are watching set a godly example. One of my more, most favorite times, um, every time we have an opportunity to do this, Faith Family Sunday. It's such an encouragement because our kids are in this room. And did you know that they, they are watching? They are watching you as mom and dad sing to Jesus. They are watching you open your Bible and look at it. Do you know the profound effect that that makes on a child's life? It's huge. And what's more is that they're watching you take notes and do not listen. One of the funnest things that I saw even last, last time when we had faith family worship is that there were kids in here watching watching another child be baptized. I'm okay if that spurred conversation at home. That's okay. Because they get a chance to hear from mom and dad, why did Roman get baptized? Well, let me tell you why. These are the things that are important, guys. Paul here is saying, let your example and your words before your children remind you that they matter. They matter. I'll never forget Paul Tripp, um, is a uh, counselor. He was a former pastor. He's a conference speaker. And he does a great job, particularly in marriage conference. If you guys haven't heard Paul Tripp, I, I highly recommend uh, Paul David Tripp. And I like the guy already because not only does, is his name Paul, but he married a Cuban. So he's just cool in my opinion. It's like, whatever. And needless to say, he, he began one of his marriage conferences um, by talking about how uh, for him, uh, being timely and, and, and doing, uh, getting to places on time is important to him. And at the time, he was a pastor at a church, and um, they were trying to gather the kids together uh, for Sunday morning. And all of us know that Sunday morning uh, for parents, especially with young kiddos, uh, irrespective of their age, can sometimes be a challenge, right? And so we want to be spiritual when we come to church, but the truth is we are kicking our kids into the van saying, Shut your mouth, we're going to go worship Jesus, right? And here we go to church, right? Like that's how we're coming to church, where it's going to be a great day, right? And that's how we began going to church. And if you don't think that's true, come on now. It, it, it's happened at the Lasso household, okay? So if it happened to the pastor, I'm sure it's happened to you guys. <laughs> so needless to say, that's, that's how it is. So it's the same thing that he was talking about. Now that particular day, it was a special day because it was Easter. So tensions are high, okay, already. The kids are ready, he's ready, but his wife isn't ready yet. And he finds out that, you know, she's in the bathroom still getting ready. And so in, in this first session, he begins to say how he was saying very helpful things to his wife. He started saying things like, it's not Easter dinner, it's Easter breakfast, right? We need, we need to get going because they were having an Easter breakfast thing. Very helpful, huh, at that very moment. And then he began to say, well, you know, I'm an elder at the church, so I need to make sure to get there on time. You know, <laughs> look at me. You know. His nine-year-old son was in the bathroom listening. And then he approaches him and he says, Daddy, may I ask you something? He's nine. And he says, do you really think that's how a Christian man should be talking to his wife? And then trying to escape the conviction, he goes on to say, well, what do you think? And then the boys looked at him straight in the face and said, it doesn't make any difference what I think. Daddy, what does God think? Oh. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it, right? And he's just sitting there like, oh, my gosh, embarrassed. And he just kind of walks right out. But I think that furthers what I believe Paul is trying to say here, right? Guys, our words and our actions matter. Why? Because they are watching. And at the very moment, his kid had an opportunity to be able to see how is dad going to respond to the truth of what God's word says and how I ought to treat my bride. He's going to see whether or not dad says, you know what, the final authority in our home is the word of God. 
that child's going to get an opportunity to be able to see how is daddy going to talk to mommy when he needs to ask for forgiveness? How is he going to respond to the grace of God at that moment? And it's like all of that is education for children. At that very moment, as the adage is true, there is more that is caught by sight and by eyes and by ears than it is taught. And how he responds at that very moment is profound to the upbringing of that child. And I don't think, again, it's nothing coincidental that Paul here is building all of this up. Personally, you need to live like Jesus. In your marriage, you need to make sure that it exemplifies Jesus. And then he begins to say, parents, all of that is part and parcel to how you educate your children. Every single bit of it. So it, it, it begs of the, of the answer to the question, uh, mom, dad, how are you living in front of your children? How, how, is, how is Jesus coming out of your life? in front of your children. And mind you guys, I get it. None of us are perfect. They get to see both sides, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it all. And all of it, all of it is a great opportunity to be used as an opportunity to be able to shape them and help them understand. And we'll get to some of that here in a little bit. This is the part where you may say, well, you know what, Paul, you know, I I get all you're saying about parenting, all but I'm I'm not a parent. I'm I'm, maybe one day I want to be, or right now that's just not what the Lord has for my life. Uh, Or even as guys, you know, you're you're at a place now, or older gentlemen, that you're you're way past you know children phases. Guys, do you know that fatherlessness is a thing? Do you know that even in Catoosa County, I had someone once tell me that seven out of ten. Children grow up in fatherless homes, broken homes. You know, if you go to um, the African-American home, 80%, 80% are without fathers. Hispanic homes are 60%, and, um, you know, us as white American homes, we're not too far behind. It's 50%. Men, we have an opportunity to be able to exemplify Jesus, and you may never know the profound effect that you may have on a child as they watch your life. As Paul says, be imitators of God. Be imitators of Jesus. Listen to me. Every man in this room should have the opportunity to allow another father to say, hey, do you see Billy over there? I want you to be like like Billy because Billy, Billy lives like Jesus. And if there was a man in this room that I want you to aspire to be like, be like Billy. Because, man, Billy, Billy loves Jesus, and he walks with Jesus. So listen to me. Though you may not have a child, you may never know the profound impact you may make just simply by the way you live your life. And it matters. Why? Just think of the fatherlessness. Boys, children, they crave, crave not only being loved, but led in a way that exemplifies Jesus. It, it's just there. So listen to me. All of us have an opportunity to be able to do this part personally that can impact the lives of other people. And what's more is, I'll tell you, uh, those who are older in the room and have walked this life and have raised up children, I need you. I don't have this thing figured out. And I can glean from your wisdom to be able to learn how to parent in a way that's godly and good. So I'm telling you, in all stages of life, you have a profound opportunity to be able to impact others. So that's just the instruction for us personally. Let's move on to the instructions for our children, all right? Let's move through this. Notice what Paul begins to say in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So there's even motivation there for a child, right? So that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. So let's begin with the latter and we'll come back to the obedience part. Paul says, I want you to honor your parents. Now, the word honor there means to hold in high regard or revere or to respect, okay? And how do children honor their parents? Well, think about it, okay? How do we honor God? How do we revere God? How do we respect God, right? It's often through both our actions and our attitudes of how we view God. We have an opportunity as parents to demonstrate how we honor our Heavenly Father. And then children are commanded by God to honor their parents through their attitudes and through their actions. Children honor their parents 
through their obedience. And we'll get to that more in detail here in just a moment. However, honoring parents through one's attitude is not shown through huffing and puffing, (laughs) but with a right kind of attitude that acknowledges what parents have said and then obey, right? I grew up I grew up learning the words yes, sir, and no, sir, very quickly. And I don't, I don't know about you guys, but maybe it's the same thing for you, or maybe it's the same thing that you've instructed your children to do, right? And I grew up very quickly understanding that fine, whatever, uh, or rolling the eyes is not the same thing as yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, right? And, and my parents reminded me of that, right? Listening to parents comes with the proper attitude that says, I value what my parents have said, and I will honor them by listening to what they have to say with the proper attitude, right? That's what honor means, is to bring in the right attitude to what parents are saying. Obedience, right? This one's pretty self-explanatory in terms of its definition. To obey is to put into action what one has been told to do, right? It's this idea of taking the concepts of both listening and putting into action together. We, we heard about this last week with the Shema, right? And most Jewish uh, young boys and young girls would have understood and learned that to listen is to obey. They were inseparable, right? And we have an opportunity to be able to show our children that connection. How, how do we do that, Paul? We have the Word of God, which is the voice of God, and as His followers, we obey the voice of God when we do what the Word of God says. And so all of us have an opportunity to even show our children the importance of what it means to listen to the voice of God. And this is fundamental, I think, for all of us to be reminded of and fundamental to even teach our children the importance of listening to the voice of our parents. I I can remember us helping our kids uh, see this very early on in the most dangerous place on the face of the planet, and that's the parking lot. Have you guys ever been there before? It's incredible. They have them at Walmart. They have them at Target, Publix, and they're equipped with buggies that have a mind of their own, people in cars that decide to go in different directions that are not fit for going in that certain direction, even within the parking lot where they have arrows that tell you this is where you're supposed to go, right? You see people cutting across everywhere, going all the place, and I've done it all. I get it. I understand. But at that very moment, there's something that is clashing. All of that in a parking lot and little kids that have no idea the dangers of what happens in parking lots, right? They don't know. They don't know how crazy a buggy can be in a parking lot. They just have a mind for their own. That's just how that works. But the other thing is they don't know, they don't know the power and they don't know the weight and they don't know their size and a car. I mean, kids could really get themselves in a place of danger if they don't look out for certain things. But us, in our wisdom, we know that. We've seen that, right? We understand that. And so at the lasso home, we try our best as they get out of the car to just say, freeze, don't do anything right? Just stay right by the car. My wife tells him, put your hands on the car. I'm like, oh my gosh, man, I can't wait for a church member to come by and be like, oh, I think they have handcuffs and tasers at the Lasso house. <laughs> Very early on, they're learning, put your hands on the <laughs> car. <laughs> but needless to say, what, what are we trying to do? We're helping them at the very foundation of their lives to learn that what mom and dad say is important. Listen, listen, listen to what I'm saying, because it could lead to your flourishing, and it could lead to you not getting in danger or hurt. And it it starts there and it builds. And what are we doing? We we are helping them understand that our voice, our words, they matter. Now, mind you, I get it. Nowhere in the Bible does it give us instructions of how to take care of our kids in the parking lot. But God has given us the responsibility to help them understand the dangers that are out there and to help them to say, hey, stop, no, don't, be careful. You got to stay here. And they begin to learn how significant and how important that is. And mind you, if they learn it there, that begins to transcend in every other portion of their life. They will, throughout their life, learn the importance of what it means to listen to their parents' voices when they get friends, when they interact with their teachers, when they interact in society, when they work one day, right? All of those things are interconnected, right? 
Obedience to a parent's voice is foundational. And if they learn the importance of obeying the voice of their parents, they will see the wisdom and the absolute need to obey the voice of their heavenly father. Super important. Okay, do you see how it stacks together? This is extra information, but I'll just throw it out there for, for you parents that delayed obedience is disobedience. You guys take that for where it needs to go, but that's just extra information. Now, here's the, the, the cool thing about what I love about what Paul says. Paul here gives a qualifier. Your children should honor you. Your children should obey you. But notice what he says in verse 1. He says, children, obey your parents. And then he says, in the Lord. Now, that's super significant. Because what Paul is helping parents understand there is that we ought to shape our children, and ask them to obey in a certain way. In other words, what we ask of our children to do should be morally right. It ought to be biblical. In other words, we're not demanding of our children to disobey God or do something unethical, but calling them to do what is right, what is true, what is wholesome, what is godly. So Paul here puts a good caveat, all right? Now, the truth is, because we, we as parents are asking our kiddos and those adorable children that they are, sweet and lovable to obey, when we know full well, and if we didn't believe it before, that the devil is real, well, that's because we haven't had kids yet, or you haven't had kids yet. Right? We know for a fact that our kids will fail to obey us. That's part of it. But I believe even in those moments, those are God-given opportunities to teach our kiddos the reality of sin, of brokenness, and of the gospel. And so, hear me, use the occasion of their disobedience to teach them about the gospel. Show them their absolute need to ultimately listen to a voice that is greater than them so that they will have an opportunity to be able to say, okay, I get why at times I don't obey my mom and my dad. It's because I'm, I'm broken and I need Jesus. Now, if you're a child or a teenager or if your kids when they begin to ask you the infamous question, why, 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 right? Now, I've been there already. Why should I obey you? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Paul here gives two motivations. One of them is crystal clear. It's because it's right. Listen to me, what clarity that we can find, especially in a time and an age where defining what is right and what is wrong is as ambiguous as it can be. But Paul says here, do you know what one thing is right? Obeying and honoring your parents. That is right. What's more is that he gives a little bit of motivation. There's a promise attached to this. And so Paul here borrows a concept from the Old Testament of a general principle is that oftentimes if you listen to the wisdom of your parents, if you listen to the truth of what your parents are saying that's coupled with the Word of God, your life will flourish. I can't tell you how many times I heard what my parent, what my mom and my dad said when I was a teenager, and I'm like, man, they don't know a thing. I don't know why in the world I'm listening to my parents, man. They are as dumb as rocks. And off I would go as a teenager only to find out when I'm in college, I'm like, man, my parents are the smartest people on the face of the planet. I need to talk to them more often. Dad, do you know about this? Can you help me about finances? Dad, can you help me out about this? It's like all of a sudden, it's like, wow, my mom and my dad, they're a gift from God. <laughs> it's like, and I kept going back and back and back. And I began to realize very quickly the errors and you know how I just neglected the time over and over and over again, how wise my parents were and how much they went through life and what they were trying to pour into me is wisdom. And so what happens? As a general principle, this isn't always intended to be something that will always be the case, but as a general principle, if you listen to the wisdom of your parents, you will lead a good and flourishing life. Why? Because they're there to love you, to help you avoid things that you don't need to have in your life, right? And so here Paul is saying, you want some motivation? You want to teach your kids some motivation? Not only is it right, but God even says you will flourish. You will flourish because of how you obey and honor your parents. So that's the instruction for kids. Let's move on to the instruction for us 
as parents. Now, full-blown disclosure, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry in advance. Please don't email me, but you might get um, some toes stepped on, and I apologize. I got my toes stepped on Friday and Saturday, so I figured I'd share the burden <laughs> with all of you guys, okay? Here's what Paul says to us as parents. He begins with fathers, but don't let that escape you that this is for both fathers and mothers. And then do remember that this may include the fact that it may just be mom because daddy's not there. Or it may be just dad because mom's not there. But in an ideal situation, this is a team effort that Paul's saying, hey, this is for parents. But he begins with the father because I believe the fathers are not only the heads of their homes, but what that means fundamentally is guys as husbands and guys as fathers, God has given us the responsibility and the stewardship of caring not only for our brides, but our home. We are the ones who set the tone spiritually and the direction for our homes. It should never be an ambiguous thing. We are the ones who have been given that responsibility of headship to make sure that one person doesn't feel responsible to make everything work. We do it together. So it says, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Here, as I said, he begins with fathers, and I, be I believe here what he's trying to do is help them understand how important it is for fathers to set the tone of being loving and kind and fair and also setting the spiritual temperature of the home. Now, he says that under the backdrop that back then, at that time, fathers were often very cruel and intimidating in all the bad senses within the home. And so Paul's saying, listen, as Jesus followers, you should be able to set the tone where you are seen as, yes, fine, a firm and convictional, godly father, but don't forget to be loving, kind, and fair to your kids. And so here he's setting the spiritual tone, and he uses uh, not only the spiritual tone, but the, the tone as well for how to approach parenting your children. And so he uses this word called provoke, which also means to stir up something, right? Or to prod in a particular way. And it says, I don't want you to stir your children up in anger or even discouragement. On the contrary, I want you to do something. And we're going to get to the do's, but he begins with don't. I think Tony Marita here helps with us getting a better understanding. Paul, what are some ways that we may provoke our children towards anger or even discouragement? Okay? He says the following words. He says, here's some possible causes for angering our children or discouraging our children. One, we fail to take into account the fact that they are kids. This is the part where they, they don't know everything. And we have to be wise and gentle and patient with our children because they're kids. They, they may not understand everything. Secondly, by comparing them to others, rather than acknowledging their gifting, their goodness, their special qualities, who they are, their personality, there's a bit of danger that when we begin to compare between the two. Disciplining them inconsistently. This is a hard lesson that I've had to learn from time to time. It's a team effort at home, right? If mom's going to say something, then dad should be on the same page. If dad's going to say something, then mom should be on the same page. Kids will get confused when mom says something different than dad does. And it just makes it hard. And so if they're confused, it's sometimes not their fault. It's just because maybe we're inconsistent. I'm sorry. I know that that's hard sometimes. But that happens. And so that may provoke them to both anger or even discouragement. They just don't understand. Fourth, failing to express approval even at the small accomplishments. You know what some of the most empowering words that you can say to a child are? There's two of them that are incredible in the lives of children. I love you, and I'm proud of you. If, if, there, was, if there was one thing that you can have on repeat at your home, you say those two things until they get blue in the face. I'm proud of you. I love you. I'm proud of you. I love you. Those will go so far in the lives of our children to know that they have the affirmation of their parents. It's huge within the rate. From the littlest of things 
to the big things in life. The other day, uh, Aubrey came uh, over and she wanted to show me. She drew the most crooked form of a rainbow that I have ever seen in my entire life. It didn't even look like a rainbow, but she told me it was a rainbow. Okay? And I was like, baby, I love, I'm so proud of you. That is awesome. <laughs> and she walks off. I'm like, that thing looks crazy. It looks like spaghetti. <laughs> I've never seen a rainbow look like that. But, I, but listen to me, from the smallest of things to the largest of things in life. And listen to me, I, I'm only saying that because I've remembered that. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I haven't gotten this thing right. I need help with all of that. I need to constantly be doing that. He goes on to say, failing to express our love to them, I, I beat that horse. Disciplining them for reasons other than willful disobedience and defiance. I think that goes hand in hand with consistently discipline them. But it has to match at the same time. They need to know that what they've done wrong affords a consequence. Don't confuse them with them trying to figure out why. Help them do that. You may also anger them or discourage them by pressuring them to pursue goals that's not their own. We got to be careful how much we try to live vicariously through our children. We need to acknowledge that they may have passions that are not yours, and that's okay. And then fan the flame for the things that they love. Lastly, is withdrawing love from them or overprotecting them. Um, I'll leave that one alone, but you guys are smart enough to understand how to do that, okay? That's what we shouldn't do. Here's what we should do. Paul says, I want you to do three, three things. I want you to bring them up. In other words, I want you to take responsibility for them, and I want you to make sure that you bring them up. How, Paul? In discipline and in discipleship. For one, there are moments and times where we have to be able to teach our kids the difference between what is right and what is wrong. That is, that is huge. They need to know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Because Lord, help us. We all know that society ain't going to do it. It's not going to happen. And they're, and they're going to leave just even more confused figuring out what is right and what is wrong. If there was ever, ever a time for us to be able to acknowledge the worth of God's word, it's today when we can give them a resounding understanding that God's word says, thus saith the Lord. And there's no ambiguity for it. There's clarity because there's absolute truth. My goodness, help our children know and distinguish the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And then the other side of it is it's not just that, correcting, disciplining in a way that shows them those differences, but guys, let's give them the Bible. Let's show them the story of God. Let's give them Jesus. Help your children know what the Bible has to say. And there's two ways of doing this. There's the informal way of doing it, and then there's the formal way of being able to do it. Listen, if you want curriculums, if you want ways to catechize your kids, I can find you every nook and candy of resource. For goodness sake, we even somebody have that works for Awana that comes to our church. We can show all you the, the, the ways of getting, doing it formally. It's there. Not only that, the church, I think, comes alongside of parents, and, and we do this together. That's, that's so huge. But do you know, the, do you know how, how powerful and how impactful even the informal things that we do can shape our children? It is huge. In fact, we already know how to do all of this informal way of discipling our kids. You know that, right? Like you guys already know, I'm a coffee snob. I mean, do, do you do you do you do you wonder whether or not my girls can probably make coffee now? Oh, they know. <laughs> and one day I'm gonna be like, girls, can you make daddy some coffee? <laughs> But needless to say, like, my girls have come up, and, and why, why does it happen? Is that because somehow or another I, like, pre-program and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the tone here. I'm going to bring Isabella. I'm going to bring Aubrey, and we're going to have coffee-making time. No, I love it. It's a passion of mine. And so immediately they're going to see Daddy doing it all the time, talking about it all the time, and working on it. And so what's going to happen? They're going to come alongside, Daddy, what are you doing? Making coffee? What's that? Oh, that's the grinder. And they push it, and they do all this stuff, right? And so they learn. Listen, we do this already with sports. We do this already with the things that we are passionate about and that we love. And we inadvertently, informally already teach our children the things that we love. In other words, guys, the things that we count important and are passionate about, we give priority to. And we will make sure that we do them, right? And it happens, and it happens so quickly. I even did yesterday. I was running, and there was a guy with an Alabama T-shirt on. And if you know any Alabama fan... 
There's something that you do. It's like, hello. They get offended if you don't do it, especially if they know you're another Alabama fan. You just, roll by, you just go by and you say, roll tide. And what happens? Almost immediately, what do they say back? Roll tide. Right? It's like saying hi to people. That's what it is. And so that happened. That's ingrained, right? Same thing. Listen, there are moments and times that we can show our children the truths of God's word. Think about this. This is, this is as, as old as the Shema. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5 says. You don't have to turn it up and listen. Listen very quickly to what Deuteronomy says. Do you know how parents used to teach their children the word of God? Listen to this. this is in verse 4. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These words that I am giving to you today are to be in your heart. And listen to this. Listen to this. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. In other words, every portion of your life is a teaching opportunity for your children. Mommy, why do you treat the, the grocery store clerk with kindness? Mommy, what, why, why do you stop to help people the way that you do? Why do, why do we do thoughtful things for other people? Why, why do we do this? Why? And you have an occasion and an opportunity to be able to teach them so much. Let the passion of the Word of God become the priority that you teach within your home. And that gives you a great opportunity to be able to say, hey, here's how we can do this. I love even what Proverbs does. Guys, this is so neat, even for, for us as parents. You know that Proverbs 1 through 9 is a dad sitting down and pulling, pulling a seat up with the son and saying, hey, come here, I, I, wanna, I wanna teach you about something. I wanna, I, know, I wanna show you about life. And in those conversations, as he's sitting down with his boy, he's showing them about the importance, about the fear of the Lord, about folly, about evil, about integrity, about virtue, about generosity, about the dangers of selfishness, pride, seduction, success, ruin, hard work, the dangers of laziness, and even the benefits of discipline. All as they're living life together and showing them, hey, look, I want you to look out for this. I want you to pay attention to that. This is why this is important. Every aspect of life is an opportunity to teach them the importance of what God's word says about this, about that, about anything. Guys, take the time to invest in your home, the truths of God's word. Read the Bible with your children. Take portions of it. Take the time to pray with your kiddos. Do all of those things, and it will mean the world to them. Not only do our life and our words matter, guys, as I mentioned, but how we invest into our home and take opportunity to take initiative in doing that matters greatly. And one of the other things that I wanted to mention is not only do you teach them the Word of God and instructions and all those things, but guys, uh, mom, dad, you know one of the, the, the single greatest things that we can ever do to our kids is to point them to the perfect parent, to point them to the perfect child. Do you know that God gave us an incredible visual example through Jesus of how he had a relationship with his father? And in that, there's great empathy and great encouragement because not only can we see how God relates to his son, Jesus, but in the middle of all, we have a template for how we can learn how to engage. And what's more is that in Jesus, we also recognize that we needed him to be the perfect child. We know, as the Bible says, that we were the children of disobedience, not the children of obedience. And in knowing who we are, it shows us our need to lean upon Jesus to not only learn what it means to be a child of God, but we lean all the more knowing that we're imperfect to know what it means to be able to see the relationship between the Father and the Son and how we can implement those things. So you know what that means? Parent, when you're struggling to figure out how in the world to parent your child, you look to Jesus. You look to him and you see the relationship between him and the Father and you say, I have much to learn from Jesus in that moment. And you know what other piece of wisdom that God gives to all of us? I thank God for the church. I thank God that I don't have to do this on my own. 
You know how much is caught by parents in life groups when you parent your children? You know how much you learn how you're not crazy <laughs> as a parent when you're like, oh my gosh, the kid's the same as mine? Or they do the same thing? This is so encouraging. I thought I was on an island to myself. I thought I was the only crazy parent on planet Earth. And then you look over to the right and to the left and you look to the church and your friends around you and you realize, oh, they're trying to figure it out too. And listen, those are two incredible pieces of wisdom that God gives us. The relationship between him and his son Jesus and the church benefit from those two greatly. And I think there, you and I have an opportunity to be able to find not only God's incredible wisdom and his design of the home, but we learn much of how he gives us instructions for the home. And then here's the beautiful piece of it. The gospel will shine in your home because you continue to demonstrate how God and his word, how God and his goodness is working out his purposes and plans within your home. You get to share the gospel with your children and you have the opportunity and the occasion to share with the world how the gospel is impacting every portion of your life. And that is what I believe Ephesians chapter six is all about.